Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this to this rescheduled evening commemorating Mrs. Kaya Newman, Allah Hashalom. She's a woman who I know all all the people in this room don't need to be told about, but and we are thrilled that that Reverend Young Grace is going to be here, although. I haven't seen her yet, uh, but we, we have faith. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rabbi Joseph Oratz. I have the honor of being the principal of Brewery High School now, but I think the biggest honor was the fact that for the majority for all my time at Berea, until Mrs. Newman left Berea, she, I worked for her and with her and under her. She was my mentor. Everything I know about Jewish education, um, I know because of the time that I spent with Mrs. Newman. Please excuse the raspy voice or the foghorn, as I like to call it. I'm um, just uh, in the middle of getting over a cold, so this is not necessarily the way I always sound. I would like to share a short story with you this evening, a personal story that happened just a few, uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, and it was a really special moment for me as it would, took place almost, almost one year after Mrs. Newman's Ptero just a little bit more than a year after the Herbert Zero, and right before the first time that this event was scheduled. As the graduates in the room know, and parents in the room who had, had graduates know, Mrs. Newman started a custom, if you will, um, and a really, something really special that Brewery High School did and continues to do. And she was the first to do it, and others have followed suit, but not even in the way we do it. We go to visit our graduates every year in Eretz Yisrael. Many, for many years, I was the lucky one who went along with her to visit the graduates. And we would go, she always arranged that trip around the Thanksgiving break so that she could see the girls early, late enough in the year for them to have begun to settle in, but early enough in the year so that in case there were still issues that need to be resolved, we weren't going to first see them in January when they were halfway through their year. We could actually see them about six weeks after they sort of settled in and discuss with them how they were doing, make sure they were doing okay, and if there were things that needed that needed help with that we would be able to speak to, their, uh, to the administrators of their schools and, and help them through it. And so this year, and I've been, we've been continuing that custom uh, straight through, and this year I went to visit our graduates. Now, besides spending about 15 or 20 minutes with each of the graduates, and then spending time with each of the administrators, I also have some personal time while I'm there in between running from one school to another. And when I went to visit the schools, there are, we have a school in Echemish, and a school also in another, another school in that general area, um, I had the opportunity to go to the cemetery in Beit Shemesh. Now, it just so happens that my parents are buried in that cemetery as well. So that was the, obviously the, the first reason for my going there. But it just, so, it, it just so happens that Mrs. Newman, Mrs. Newman's kever is also at that cemetery, in the Eitzheim Cemetery in, in Beit Shemesh. And so I knew when I went to visit my parents' plots that I was also going to have the opportunity to visit with Mrs. Newman. So I went into the office to find out exactly where it was. And they, they pointed me, well, you know, they told me where the plot is, and they said, just turn right out of the building and you'll see it. And they were right. Because I turned right out of the building and walked down the road, and I found the, 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 the specific alleyway, streetway, whatever it is, pathway that I'm supposed to turn onto. And I turn onto this path and there are, there's a whole area of burial plots to my left and a number of, a number of coros in there. And then as I continue to walk, all of a sudden I get to a place where 
literally sitting there as queen over an area is Mrs. Newman's cat. It, it was exactly, and I understand that as time goes on, it will get filled in. But this was to me, it was like, this is the Mrs. Newman that I know. She is, this is it, she's running the place. Okay, I mean, and it was, it was really just stunning to see that. And then I had the opportunity to go off, of course, to the Kevin. And that is really what I want to share with you today. Because on her Kevin is the following inscription. So for those of you who, and I didn't have to prepare a speech because whoever wrote these beautiful words, in fact, if someone it's just a left hand light, I think it would be. I'll just help highlight this a little bit. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I will read it to you in its original Hebrew and translate it for you as well. Chai Masha Newman Alel Shalom Bas Rav Yaakov Blumenkrantz the Chronicle of Rocha. Chai Yeha Ekdisha Laman Chinuch Habanos Berov Onim. She devoted her life with great dedication for the sake of educating Jewish girls. Working tirelessly for over 50 years to raise the bar of education. Many an institution gained from the impression she left upon them. And of course, her unique legacy was her years at Bruria. But she continued to make an, an impact on Jewish education during her time with Torah Masora. Her life's work is complete as her children and grandchildren are involved in Torah. And through her, many were attracted to a life of commitment to Torah and belief in Hashem. I don't know that I could say add any more. I mean, except for stories upon stories upon stories. But all of us who had were touched by Mrs. Newman at any point, whether it was while she was we're a principal here, whether you were a, an administrator in another school that she visited and gave you advice, whether you were one of the people who benefited from the programs that she brought to the other schools when she went to work for Tarma Sora, whether you're a member of her family and feel the impact of the life that she led and therefore the as she raised her own children and therefore you're the beneficiaries of that. If you're a parent in this room and your daughter went to Bruria and developed a relationship with Mrs. Newman, and even if she didn't, if she developed a relationship with any teacher in this building, if she gained anything at all in her years at Bruria, that all came from Mrs. Newman. And every person in this room is here tonight is here because Chaya Masha Newman made a difference in every one of our lives. For that, I thank you very much for coming and giving her the honor she so richly deserves. Yeah, um, I would like this, to take this opportunity now to call upon Mrs. Newman's daughter, Mrs. Shona Spikus, to say a few words. We find the word miksha used to describe the construction of two of the kalim of the Mishkan, the Kruvim and the Manoa, which were both to be constructed from a single piece of gold. In Medrash Tanchuma, we learned that the Manoa actually made itself. Vasita minarat ahavtahar miksha te'aseh. 
Moshe couldn't visualize how the menorah was supposed to look. And so Hashem showed him a menorah made of fire. But he still couldn't figure out how to construct it properly. So he was commanded to throw the gold into the fire, and the menorah formed itself. The krubim were also supposed to be formed from one piece of gold at each end of the kaporet, seemingly an equally difficult task. But the Pasuk here says, Mekshat ha'aseh otam. The krubim were made by man, and not by Hashem. Though their con this construction should have been equally difficult. Why? The krubim were shaped like children. To be mechanic children properly, we need hard work and active involvement. The menorah symbolizes wealth. And we know, though it doesn't happen often enough, I'm sure, that that can happen without hard work because wealth comes directly from Hashem. As the Pasuk says, Hakol Videh Shamayim. Educating a child, however, cannot happen by itself and needs hard work and active involvement on the part of others. My mother, Mrs. Numan al was a master teacher, a master mechanechet. And I'd like to share a few thoughts, a few memories that will illustrate that. She famously said that if a student does not know how to read, we teach her how to read. And if a student doesn't know math, we teach her math. Yet if a student doesn't know how to behave, we punish. Mrs. Newman preferred to actually teach the child how to behave, just like one teaches any other subject. Behavior issues were rare in Berea. Mrs. Newman never raised her voice in all her years here as principal. Any student who wanted to speak to her about anything knew that she could and had the opportunity to do so, because each and every student knew how important they were to her. My mother, here's a little secret for all the former students in here, my mother would spend her summer preparing for the school year, which included taking color photographs of all incoming freshmen, pasting them onto a big poster board with their names written underneath. She'd hang it in the house, and by the end of the summer, by the time the first day of school came around, she'd memorized all their names and faces and could read them by name as they entered school. She truly cared about each girl. The following is an excerpt from a letter we received from a graduate during Shiva. Aside from her skills as an educator and administrator, which were formidable, Mrs. Newman had a care and love for her students that was unbelievable. She spoke about me at senior night and called me one of her granddaughters because my mother had also been a Berea graduate. But I don't think it was a figure of speech. I truly believe that she loved me and each and every one of her students as if they were her daughters and granddaughters. What was so remarkable about Mrs. Newman was despite her own diamond heart convictions and hashkafos, she had a big enough heart and a broad enough mind to love and accept girls of so many backgrounds, viewpoints, and ideologies, and to create a school where all of them could be valued. She came into Berea from her own, shall we say, yeshiva background, and created a school where girls from public school, day school, and base Yaakov schools could all find a place to learn and grow. Her lessons of understanding, acceptance, and true Ahava Yisrael that she imparted through her actions and through her magnificent school really changed the way I think and behave. My Maria friends and I are all vastly different, but our differences deepen our relationships rather than destroy them. That is entirely a credit to Mrs. Newman. She encouraged me and so many others to grow and to strive for more while showing me that it's possible to, greet, to reach great heights without looking down at anyone else. This graduate is now a teacher of Berea. But she didn't do it alone. She, told, she chose teachers who could follow her lead and be positive role models, caring and compassionate, non-judgmental adults in the lives of the students. 
a parent of several Berea graduates, writes the following as his last daughter from the year's graduation. They learned me don't, not only from texts, but from observing your teachers and spending Shabbatot with them. They grew in knowledge of Jewish and secular studies, but not as tuition-paying students with ID numbers, rather as individuals with specific needs, skills, and goals that you observed, nurtured, and documented. Your academic and, extra and extracurricular activities allowed each young woman to achieve as much or as little of her potential as she desired. I began to wonder, how do you do it? How did you put together a faculty that is so talented and knowledgeable and perceptive? I trusted you with our daughters, Nishamas, and you proved worthy of their trust. You watched over their physical welfare and met my uh, criteria for diligence regarding safety. And every alumnus is welcomed home to Berea with open arms. And so many of you are here tonight to prove that. Tonight's inspiring words from Robinson Young Rice on the topic of turning negatives into positives is so apropos at a memorial event for my mother. And I'd like to conclude with the following thought. When considering her caring connection to thousands of young women, her confidence in their abilities, her encouragement to realize their full potential, I am reminded of the teaching of Mayor Shapiro of Lublin as itself. They will also attempt with boldness to accomplish the impossible beyond the realm of the natural and will not measure their desire by their ability, but their ability by their desire. video that we would like to like to show you uh, this video was originally some of you may have seen it it's actually some of it has been up uh, on our website this video was actually prepared uh, by um, some brief students for last year's mother-daughter luncheon which was dedicated to mrs. Newman um, so that's one piece of the video but then <clears throat> for the 50th anniversary of Berea at the JC dinner um, they added another piece of the video because the video continues on to talk about Berea today and things that are going on. And we decided to keep that in, even though that's not part of the commemoration to Mrs. Newman, because it really is the commemoration of Mrs. Newman. Because it's one thing to do something in your lifetime while you're in a particular institution. But I can tell you from sitting in the chair that she occupied, the position that she occupied, which well, I don't know how she did what she did. I do not understand it. I really, I thought I, I thought I, I, I was impressed by her when, when I worked with her, and now now that I have to try to do what she was doing, I really don't know how she did it. But I can tell you one thing: the legacy that she left in this building, the messages that she gave us, the tone that she wanted to set for what Berea is and what it ought to be that is a thriving in this building. And because Baruch Hashem, we have this incredible, this incredible staff, many of whom are still on staff that were trained by her and mentored by her. And of course, because of the time that I had to work with her, and so she taught me how to, what kinds of girls that we're looking for to, 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 to bless our school with when they come in in ninth grade. And so the school continues to be in the image uh, of Mrs. Newman. Uh, before I show this video, since I'm afraid later on we're going to be all caught up in, um, in having heard of Revis and Young Rice, that I want to have the opportunity to do this. So you know that an evening like this doesn't happen by itself. I wanted to thank um, Adina Abramov, um, <laughs> the director of PR, and Leo Rothstein, who, because of, she's outside? She, okay, well, Okay, because um, Adina is expecting any, literally any moment. Um, Leo was given the up the job of, of running things for this evening, um, and of course, uh, Pinchas, now that you're in the room, thank you so much for uh, for catering for the Malamaka that's to follow. And of course, nothing in at all in this institution happens 
um, without the two additional probate sites who's staying at the back. So thank you very much. And now. <laughs> Mrs. Newman's guiding force, her vision. 
she had this idea of what she wanted Gloria to be, and by the sheer will of her determination, she made it what it is. She she had this paradigm in her head of what she wanted for the girls, what she wanted for the school, and we just went along for the ride. And I can say that. Yes, we've done an incredible job in educating the girls in terms of the information that we give them, in terms of the skills that they learn, in terms of all the extracurricular programs that we run. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is that our girls know that we care about them immensely. And because of that, that completely opens them up to actually hearing what it is we want to tell them. Bray High School is a place where every student is cared about for themselves. In the classroom, on the basketball court, on the softball field, in charge of a committee, part of a committee, involved in something, involved in an activity, involved um, in their class, involved in the school. We make sure that each of the students have relationships with teachers, where you sit and you can schmooze and you can talk and you can really develop a relationship and learn from your teacher both inside and outside of the classroom. I have a lot of fond memories of Maria. One of the fondest is our spontaneous rural riots where we would, without texting or cell phones or calling each other, just spontaneously mobilize in the hallways and break out into song and dance for about 15 minutes or so. Um, and block the hallways and the doorways so the teachers couldn't even get into the classrooms. Um, I don't recommend it to the girls today. It's hard to believe that it's 25 years since I first started teaching Maria, but what's so amazing is that despite all the changes that have taken place in students, in education, uh, and in the faculty over the last 25 years, Maria has always been the school that was open to and welcomed innovation. So that as our student population changed, because Jersey grew and the number of Jewish communities in the area increased, we were ready. And when the needs of the educational system changed, the computers had to be integrated, um, as the sciences became important, when our students joined uh, academic teams, not just sport teams, we were ready. Uh, the faculty here uh, always knows that whenever we run a program, we're going to get together after that program and find out how we can do it better next time. Never the same. How we can do it better. Because in Maria, we're always primed to do things better. We're always ready to change and we're always eager to embrace the needs of our students and therefore the dynamic uh, that is the only way to describe a school situation. We are blessed with an incredible faculty. Besides being experts in their field, they take the time both in class and out of class, to connect with the students, to build a pressure with their students, to the point where our parents, when their students become parents, they send their girls back to the room because they want them to experience that same education that they had when they were in school. People often ask me, is there such a thing as a typical warrior girl by the time they leave the school, what are they looking to accomplish? And the truth is that there's no typical warrior girl because everyone is coming from a different walk of life, perhaps from a different Ashtabra, certainly from many different communities. And they're going to end up in a lot of different places, both professionally and personally. And if there was one thing that I would say was typical of a warrior girl, is that they learned and embodied the lesson that we teach here, which is you always need to improve, you always need to be improving moving forward, then yes, that would be perhaps a typical warrior girl. Maria here from the time when we used to have roof riots? <laughs> Somebody tell you, the, the younger graduates have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. This is, by the way, by the way Rose Yammer has just, just pulled up, so we're, we're actually, our timing is, is perfect. Um, for those of you who think that the roof riots were spontaneous, they weren't. 
Um, we planted the idea in someone's head and someone just said it. However, I will tell you there was one time early in my career at Berea when we had a rough riot and um, Mrs. Newman told me to stop it and I didn't and I got my head handed to me. Okay, anyway. Rabbits and young rice. We're going to let you step up here in a moment. I think this is set up right here. Put this on first. This is a microphone. You don't want to hold it? Oh, great. It's even better. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is, a, this is someone who I think needs absolutely no introduction, but I want to say one, first of all, I just want to reintroduce myself. Um, I'm Joe Juarez. I'm president, they call me Rabbi Juarez. I'm the, uh, <laughs> I'm the principal now, I took over after Mrs. Newman left, I was co-principal with Mrs. Stern, and then I took over. Rabbit and Young Rice was one of Mrs. Newman's favorites. Um, and whenever we were able to get her to come to school, whether it's through Shabbaton or just to come to speak to the girls, um, wherever we were able to pull it off. Um, it, Mrs. Newman was absolutely thrilled because Rabbit and Young Rice embodies exactly what Mrs. Newman was really trying to do. Yes, it was important to educate and the knowledge, all of that was important. But at the end of the day, if we weren't inspired and we weren't committed, then all of that knowledge wasn't going to be worth anything. And Rabbit and Young Rice was one of those people that Mrs. Newman knew she could count on to take whatever it was knowledge that they had and make sure that it went into them in a way that they were then going to then use it um, in their own lives. But Mr. Young Rice, it is an absolute honor for us to have you here this evening. Thank you. from the days of Mrs. Newman, we know that I look a little bit different. Now I have a shtetl. <laughs> and the reason I have a shtetl is because I broke my hips. Yes. And you know what I do with the shtetl? I make shticks. Shtetl and shticks come from the same word. One word. So I make a shtick tonight and have a great night. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know if it really comes from the same word, but I made it up. <laughs> in any event, it's my thoughts to speak in memory, in honor of Mrs. Newman. She was not just a Mechanechet, her excellence. She was a Neshama who gave her Neshama to others. And she was someone that will never be forgotten. The shamans like hers are never picked up. This is my cover to speak in honor, in honor of her. The topic that was given to me for tonight is turning negatives into positive. How do you do that? It's saying in Yiddish, track good and stack sign good. Think good, it will be good. Does it work? Does it really work? Good. Somebody comes to me with a real problem. I say, talk good, think good, it will be good. I said them so it work. It sounds good, but faculty speaking, it's tough. It's very tough. So how do you change the, change the negative into positive? What does it mean to be you? Ever think about it? Where did the book have to write on that subject? I will tell you now, it's in my new book. Be a blessing. When the whole Bina was given his mission by Hashem, the first joint of the world, he was told that he would be a blessing. Be a blessing. Wouldn't it be better to be blessed? To receive brachas? We were walking to be mevochim, to be blessed? Or go to Rabbi? And to every place, get me a bracha, I need a blessing. But we are told, be a blessing. Not be blessed, be a blessing. Which one would you rather have? To get brachas? Or be a bracha for others? Most of us, give me a bracha. If you're honest. But does it really work? Which is better? A blessing? Or to be blessed. 
If you're going to go for blessings, it's never over. You need a blessing for a shirk. You need a blessing for children. You need a blessing for penis. You need a blessing for this, for this, for that. And you're never satisfied. You're never at peace. But if you are blessed, like Abu Marina was, may Ibrahim be a blessed person, be a blessing to others, be a blessing to others, then you are blessed. Abu Marina was a blessing to others, and that's why he became a blessing to others. That's why he was a blessing. Now think about it. I'll give you some illustration. Even the most horrible circumstances the most awful situations. If you are going to be a blessing like Abba Mobinu was, and that's the mission of every Jew, then he brought up be a blessing. I don't think people do think about it. If you think about it, you realize, you know, I have spoken on this subject so many places, and most people never thought about it, that we, the Jewish people, and we said, had this mission, they brought up to be a blessing. So how does it work? I'll give you some examples. When I started Hineni, that was like almost 50 years ago, and the first Bachula woman in the world, in the world. So I had this crazy idea to take Madison Square Garden and bring Jews from all over the world and build a garden. I didn't have an organization yet. I didn't have money. It was a crazy idea. But my tante said, Bachtiho Bokho Hashem Tanse. Hashem, we bless you in everything you do. You have to stay my king, you should do it, and the Bokha has come, and the Bokha will come. So I went from college campus to college campus, gathering students, went to Queen's College. Those if there was Yavne, a campus organization of full people. So they told me, Webberson, if you want to come, fine, but you won't have more than 20 students. I said, 20 students, 20 students. Thank you all to take medicine square garden. So I arrived. Guess what? 750 students were waiting. <laughs> so it's never happened before. So someone called the New York Post, and they come to cover the story. The next day, with my picture, there's a story in the Post. The Jews finally have their Billy Graham. She's <laughs> my and she's loved. Well, I went home and I saw, I started to cry. I said to my husband, what does this mean? People get a wrong impression. So my husband says, I wish I know, don't be foolish. It's Basha, he'll help you. Wherever you go, people want to come to see the Billy Graham of the Jews. <laughs> Ever since the one come, Billy Graham, yes, they'll come. And Kahul. So I come back to South Africa to speak, Johannesburg. Those days was an apartheid state. And I come to the only Glasgow Share Hotel in those times. And I come in there. And in the lobby, I see two people, husband and wife. And they look like the Malachim was just visited them. They look so sad, so tragic. So I see to the proprietor, what is the matter with that couple? So she tells me a tragic story. They have two sons. One son was mentally, emotionally unstable. The other son was brilliant. So the son who was unstable, the family obtained for him a position at the Israeli embassy to be a security guard. In those days, there was no security problem. No problems in South Africa. It was a police state. And that province was with uh, terrorism. It didn't happen. So, this son was emotionally unstable. To the end of his head, that we an attack. An attack. And nobody believed him. So one day he started to shoot. And he called his brother to come and help. His brother ran. And he helped. And unfortunately, both boys ended up in prison. Now, if you are in prison in South Africa, it's not like him in those days anyway. If you are in prison, that's it. You don't have access to anyone. So I go over to the couple, and I say to them, would you like me to visit him? Look at me like I'm crazy. 
They said, then? We'll never have a, I mean, nobody will have a look at you. They won't let you in. I said, let me try. So I go. You got them with Sosa Tami, you know, we have a teacher. You try, and Hashem will go help you. So I go there, and I come to the gates, and they stop me. I said, excuse me, and I think of the daily paper, Johannesburg Star, on the front pages, the Jewish bulletin of wife to Johannesburg. <laughs> It's my photograph. So, Jewish people bring him from America. You have to let her in. <laughs> so I go, and just for a few minutes, they tell me. So I'm armed with a Hamish, a Siddha that has to hand in, in it also, and that's how I go. They let me take these two books after examining them. I did not have permission to see the boy who was the shooter, or the emotionally sick boy, but I did have permission to see the brother who was well. They bring him out. <coughs> and you, you, you can't imagine. You can't imagine. Perhaps you can't imagine. So I said to him, look, I have a few minutes. My name is Esther Young Grace. I come from New York, but I come from Yerushalayim. I'm your sister. Everything that happens to us, because find the president to in the Torah. You're never afraid. You are never to be afraid. Just open the Torah. Open the Chumash. When you look, look at the first instance that that occurrence had taken place. Always look for the first place, and then you'll find your answer. Looks at me amazed. I said, listen, who was the first person to be in prison just like you? He looks at me. You'll see what What do you mean? Don't you know? What did you see what Sadiq do in prison? What did he do? Two miserable people got there from the palace of power who hated Jews and abused him and that glory of him even after him because he was a Jew. And one day he sees them in prison and they have some strange look on their face. Look very sad. Says, I'm a penitent boy, my Why is your face so sad today? Gentlemen, what's the matter? Why is your face, face so sad today? I'm a penitent boy, my Now you and I, we see two anti Semites who plague us, who torture us. We see them, and they have a sad look on their faces and say, Good! It's coming to them. Babu Hashem. I said, Yosef HaTzadik said, Lama Pane Chemoim Hayo. What does that mean? Why are you so sad, gentlemen? And they tell him, they tell him about their dreams. And as a result, one of the ministers is free, and he said to him, that when you are going to be free, and remember me to power. And yes, he says, Why you Mochecho? And he forgot. As usual, the story, people forget when they are rendered a favor, but Hashem did not forget, and he's allowed to go free. So, do that chesed here in prison. Wherever you meet, you say, Mama Panechem, we mayam, keep that in mind. How are you? How are you? He says, Who am I going to say that to? I said to the gods, to your fellow prisoners, How are you? Good morning. He looks at me. He says, I can't even get up in the morning. I can't move. I can't get up in the morning. You know what you do? Come on, I want us a boy. Get up and serve your creator. Serve my creator here? Yeah. Yes. Darwin, you're serving your creator. Say, a little pill and nothing else. Make your brothers. He looks at me. I said, listen, don't be careful on telling you. Follow my teaching. It's not my teaching, it's Torah. <laughs> Don't forget it. And I left. Ten years, or maybe twelve years, not the line. Fast forward. I'm speaking in a certain community here in the United States. When I speak, as the night, I stay behind to sign my books for everyone who saw the desires. So I was signing books. It was 1 a.m. in the morning. Everybody was gone away. Only the rabbi was still there. And my friends. 
so I say, who is left? I'm going to speak to everybody already? Can I sign every book? Yes, but there's one gentleman who asked to be the last. He wants to speak to you. I said, oh, I bring it. Members and young wives, I've been waiting for 10 years to ask your question. Which comes first, Moza Ani or Kumula Vaida Sabaiwe? <laughs> Did you believe this? I said, you cannot be. She said, I am. How'd you get out? There's a prison record. How'd you come to this country? How did you let you in? Ain't you tell me, Kumula Vaida Sabaiwe? Be a blessing. Now blessing you'll be blessed. Let me give you some other example. A girl comes to me crying hysterically. Just a year ago. Her engagement was broken. She thought she was getting married. It was public. It was announced. Everybody knew that she was getting married. And then he broke it up. She said she's ashamed to go on the streets. She can't take it. She can't bear it. And she went on and on and on. She can't go to shul. Everybody's looking at her. She can't breathe. She can't sleep. She can't go to work. She had her ring. She gave it back. She was about to get married. The invitations went out. The invitations went out. The last minute he broke off. She's hysterical. I said, you know what? Be a blessing. Come and help us over here to make shidduchim. I have a young lady who makes the shidduchim prayers with my supervision. Her name is Phyllis. She needs help, I said. Come join us. So she's been working every Thursday night when I speak on shidduchim. And guess what? A year and a half passed, and now she's engaged. She met somebody wonderful, right there at Hineli. Be a blessing. She could have gone home and she'll been crying and be, having been depressed. No. My husband's out of cancer. I don't have to tell you what that means. Seven weeks, as long carrying it was over. He was six foot two, in perfect shape. It's 18 years now. Never sick a day in his life. I can't begin to tell you three surgeries, three procedures in seven weeks. One more torturous than the other. In his last few weeks, at Sloan. He found out that in the next room there was a man, a Jew, who converted to be a Buddhist. So my husband sent me to go there. But he said, I also want to go. I said, please, how, how could you go? He had an open stomach. They couldn't close him up. What the hell? He can't imagine. He was attached to all kinds of, all kinds of, all kinds of things bags and IDs and you, you, you know the story. You ever been in a hospital and seen these things. So my husband insisted. So we took him. There was this wonderful track, to take one second from one room to another for just a half an hour. My husband comes in. He says to him, Shalom Aleichem. He answers, I'm not a Jew. And my husband goes on, what's your Jewish name? I told you I'm not a Jew, bad boy. Listen, did you have a puppy? Yeah, yeah. A puppy, yeah. What did she call you? Surely she called you by your Jewish name. She called me some crazy name. Tell me what? Bible. So my husband says, how can a Bible be a Buddhist? <laughs> and takes him and with his arms full of ivies, he puts his arms around him and kisses him. 
<laughs> and that was the end of his being a Buddhist. <laughs> a few days later we found out the news that I was told by the hospital. He has to go to hospice. Hospital no longer would cover him. This whole class of hospice makes me crazy. She's another subject altogether. Waiting room for death. I never heard of this. I never heard of this. And you know, Chas Vashon, if somebody was in a situation like this, Chas Vashon, he watched over him with the family. Put him in a place that waiting for him to, to die. It, it's so horrible. But I don't want to digress. I have visited them and I couldn't help them. In any event, now my husband visits him again. And he says, Rabbi, I'm so afraid. What will I say to God when I get up there? What will I say? And my husband put his arms around him again. Bible, don't be afraid. He said, Shema Yisraya, and I'm davening with me, and I'll be coming soon also when I put my arms around you, I hold your hands and we go together. Be a blessing. My husband says, I forgot his pain, and try to be a blessing to another Jew, do you understand this? Be a blessing. And his last surgery, his final surgery, a few days later, he went to Shamayim. The doctor comes out, the surgeon tells me to pursue it all about the good news. He doesn't have too much left, just a few days. But if he wants, could go inside to recovery. Don't stay too long because it's a lot of pain. So I go in and I say, everything will be all right. I just spoke to the surgeon. You'll be fine. So he looks at me and says, I'm in an endless let's talk to See that young man over there? He points to a young man. A resident. He says, he's a fine Jewish boy. Find him a shidduch. <laughs> Would you believe this? I know but you cry or laugh. But then I understood. Before he's called to Shemayim, he wants to have a boy, no have a He wants to have a boy, no have mitzvah. He wants to get one more mitzvah. Be a blessing. I like to have a person. You know that I'm a survivor of the Holocaust. We arrived to have a person. I'm not going to describe to you the conditions that after marching, my little brother was sick, and my older brother and I were carrying him. He had fever, he had mumps. If you found out, the dogs kept caught up with you, the German shepherd. You arrived not to bag a person. And my, my parents come in another transport. My father says to me, Lich the king lights, precious light. Miss Nachana, Miss the do you want to make a miss for him? What miss for can I do? I was a little girl. I can't. For Grace, you smile her, try to smile. If the dogs will see you smiling, little girl, they will smile also. Zaya Brucha, be a blessing. Do you understand this? Do you understand this? Be a blessing. No matter what the situation is, be a blessing. My father was sick in the hospital, so I would come to visit him. My kids, who saw the vacuum? Why did you come? If the Chazai came and you are so busy with the kinder of your children. Hey, Tariq, go back to your home, to your husband, to your children. But I'd be sure do, but if you are here, Zaydi, my heart, please, go next door. There's a lady there who's crying so all the time. I cannot visit her, but you can. If a brother go before show him. Do you understand this? Wherever life takes you, no matter what, could always be a blessing to others. If you are a blessing to others, you are blessed. 
you have the courage to go on. You have the strength, the initiative, the inspiration to go on because you are a blessing to others. Never forget that. That is your manifesto as a Jew. Prior to the concentration camps, prior to a deportation, I come from Hungary. We heard what was going on. Somebody escaped and told us that Jews were being made into lampshades, into soap. We couldn't believe it. Yes, it was crematory. My parents decided to visit my Zadie and my Bobby. I lived at the other end of Hungary. It was a very difficult trip because in those days, Jews were attacked and you could not call the police. There was no such thing. I spoke in the American army to every branch. One day I spoke in Fort Hood, Texas. 45,000 soldiers. It's the largest army base in the world. So the generals, the officers <coughs> came over to me and they asked, could we bring our wives and children next time? We want them to hear you. And they came. I had questions and answers. Someone who grew up like eight years old gets up and she salutes and she says, Benison Ben! <laughs> well, they're trained. Can I ask you a question? I said, of course, we found. Why did you call the police? Why did I call the police? How do I explain to an American child that the police was, was more brutal? More brutal. <coughs> we couldn't call the police. There's no such thing. We couldn't call the police. So now we arrived to Bergen, Belgium. And we have all that pain and all that suffering. But before that, he meant for Zadie's bracha, for my grandfather's bracha. Because we knew that. Who knows when we'll see him next. So my Zadie lived at the other end of Hungary. And we lived at the other end. My Zadie was a great rabbi, and my daddy was a great rabbi. Now we take that trip. My father had a long boy, a long beard, was dressed in rabbinical garb. My brothers had pants. A trip like that. We couldn't call the police. We couldn't call the police. And we were victims. Anyone could attack us with impunity. Anyone. Chazdi Hashem, with great miracles we arrived to the shtetl where my city was the river. It was very cold. Hungary and winters could be very cold, and the snow kept falling. Chazni Hashem Mekan. My grandparents are waiting for us at the door. They picked us up like only grandparents, Zadis and Bobbies, can hug you and pick you up. My Bobby made a delicious dinner for us. How she needed, I don't know, because Jews could not obtain food supplies in those days. But if anyone here has a puppy, you know that puppies can make miracles for their grandchildren. So we had the delicious dinner. Every morning, my tante went to shoot. would come home, would go into his store and sit at his library, take out his gummers, and he would learn. And I would want to go to his library. Look back into me, keep my hair lifted, kid. Come here, my sweet, precious child. And I would go, pick me up, seat me on his knees, and that so secure under his beard would be rocking back and forth. And then the last day came, it was time to go home. And my Zadie saw to tremble. I was on his knees. My city was trembling. I looked up. He's crying. I went to my father. Tati, Tati, the say the wind. My city is crying. And my Tati started to cry. And he said, Come, Lechlikin, come, my precious one. We'll take a walk outside. I will explain to you 
My Zadie is crying. So we walk outside to snow is still very deep. My father said, Okay, Nash, I will go first and you will follow me. And so we're walking. I follow my father's footsteps. And then my father stopped and he said, Lech the kind, my precious light, Hospice Shannon, did you understand why I told you to go first? I'm sorry, why I went first and I told you to follow in my footsteps? I said, I think so. My father did not want me to fall. The snow is very deep. So my father made footsteps for me. And my father said, you're my king, yes, my joy. And that is why you say he is crying. You say he is crying because now he's making footsteps with every word that he's learning. It's because the snow will be very deep. And you will fall. And when you fall, you should remember Zayda made a path for you. Look for it and stand up and keep going. I was a little girl. I didn't understand that. But very soon I found out that the snow was much deeper than I could have ever imagine. And I fell many times. But every time I fell, I remembered my father's words. I searched for the path. And I found it. I kept going. I kept going. Today, angry time Nicola. And I tell them about the footsteps of Satan. to Hungary, I speak there many times, and I go to visit the following the graves of my Zadis, and I tell them about everything that happened to us, and I thank my Zadis, my great great Zadis, because my Zadie and whose knees I said, never came back from Auschwitz. No, my grandmother, no, my Bobby, no, my aunts, no, my uncles. I tell my great Zadis, my other Zadis, to please find in Shemai my Zadie on whose knees I would sit, who made a path for me. And tell them I thank them for the path. Because I've been walking on it, I try. And today I started in Haiti 50 years ago, so that all our people all over the world, I have traveled the world, every continent, so every Jew should be able to walk on that path. Every Jew should be able to walk on that path. When the war was over, my daddy did that which every year would do looking for family who survived. Did anyone survive? Anyone? And then so came no one. We had 86 Rebonim in Hungary. By the name of Young Rice, Oma Mishpok, I married the Young Rice also. I saved in my body. My cousins, my aunts. I mean the Nechdo, the granddaughter, the only granddaughter from the house of my Zaydi. And my father, the Banyochi, the only son. So what do you think my father did? Then he discovered that he's the only son. He stood up from his chair. His eyes were drenched with tears and his beard became wet with tears. He said, we find you Shalina, Almighty God. Ich bin no Isaac. I ask you for you only one thing, no Isaac, only one thing. Another my kinder, the life of my timer. And all my descendants should be made by timer. Isaac, only one thing. All my children should return. I should stay with God. Now why am I telling you this story? Because every one of you in this room 
had a zany someplace somewhere. Maybe not the zany that you know, but there was a zany someplace somewhere. Maybe an I was in a great zany or great great zany. Who made a path for you? Who is waiting for you to walk on that path and is asking only for one thing, Isaac, please stay on the path of Tyra. Only Isaac, one thing. Can I prove it to you that the Zadis need a path for you, that are always walking with you? Of course I can. Everything I say is always some of Tyra. How do we say hello to each other, we Jews? Shalom Aleichem, no? Aleichem Shalom. Something is wrong with that phrase. In Israel, they dropped it. Shalom. No Aleichem. Shalom. Chavili people, real from people say, Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. I want Shalom. Why? They are right. Aleichem is you in the plural, correct? You say Shalom Lach. Shalom Lacha, that's singular, but Alechem is in the plural, in the plural. So you say it in the plural. Why? And why did they drop that plural? Logically, it's, they should have dropped it, but it's Alechem in the plural, because with every person, we know who walks with you. You say these and your puppies. So we say shalom to you. We are saying shalom to you and all you say these and the puppies who come to walk with you. And the Malachim who bring them. So tonight, I will be able to say to you, Kindalach, no matter where life takes you, no matter where life takes you, in illness, in pain, in sorrow, you're looking for a shiver, you're looking for this, you're looking for that. Always focus on being a bracha to others. My saving his first tragic moment when he knew was taken to Auschwitz, made a terror for us, a path for us. And when he heard, he heard the most horrific news that human being can hear. Everybody's gone. He got up and he says, no time to Einzach, Einzach! Just one thing, and my children should remain with Torah. And the Zayvis come, and they walk with you, and they'll help you. They'll help you to find the devil of the path. So I say through to all of you tonight, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom to you, and to you Zayvis, who walk with you. Forgive me for my tears. But when I see a Israel, I have to cry. We lost six million. And it's not over. It's not over. So the tears come, and I cannot hold them back. So I get benched. Be blessed. Should have Yiddish and Achas. Yiddish and Achas. From your own life, that's the first thing, from your own life. Even if you are not married, even if you don't have children, have Yiddish and Nachas from your own life and be a blessing. Zayat <coughs> Kabej, be blessed. The Sakma Rebbe, the old Sakma Rebbe, before he died, he was in Eretz Yisrael with his Hasidim as he was about to leave to the United States. The Hasidim accompanied him to the airport and they said to him, Rabbi Dunz Ben Shem, who will bless us if the Rabbi is not here? So the Rabbi said, go to someone, man to the Gehenna, and still believes in Hashem. He will give you the Prophet. I am to the Gehenna. I hope that Hashem considers I still believe in Him. So I give it this drug. So it's the bench. God bless it. You are Mecho Hashem, you Shmecho. You are Hashem, Pono Bilecho, Bekon Necho. Yisro Hashem, Pono Bilecho, Yisro Hashem, Pono Bilecho, Yisro Hashem, Pono Bilecho, Yisro Hashem, Pono Bilecho, Yisro Hashem, P
be a brother of the head, brother, be a blessing. I could never. Rabbits and members, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your inspiring words. I believe that each one of us has the ability to make a difference in someone else's life. And I believe that that's certainly one of the messages, one of the messages that Mrs. Newman and Al Shalom sort of felt very strongly about in her own life. It's something that she wanted all her students to learn, all her teachers to learn, go out and make a difference, make an impact. And as Robert Simeon writes, said to us this evening, be, be a blessing. So the rest of this evening, um, Brothers and Young is going to be here at the table in the front, okay? Um, if you want to talk with her, she will be signing books. Um, also, uh, now that the partitions have been moved, uh, you will turn around and you will see um, a beautiful spread has been set up. Uh, you're welcome to uh, enjoy each other's company, enjoy seeing old classmates, old friends, young classmates, young friends. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining us this evening. And as Brother Samuel said, we should go out there and all of us should be a blessing to everyone. Have a good talk.